Hello, my name is Gunnar Klein. I'm head of uh, arithmology and electrophysiology at the Hanover Medical School in Hanover, Germany. And um, I'm happy to share our cryoballoon experience with you. Um, since we started this cryoballoon approach um, uh, about five years ago. Well, the cryoballoon ablation uh, was developed since physicians were interested in improving safety of conventional uh, radiofrequency ablation. They were interested in improving time effectiveness of AF ablation facing the enormously increasing population of symptomatic atrial fibrillation patients. They were interested in making procedures easier and simpler concerning catheter manipulation and more um, user independent. And they were interested in an ablation approach for atrial fibrillation that according to its risk benefit ratio could be applied as a first line therapy in symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients. So the cryo-balloon technology comes along as a double balloon um, system, double lumen balloon system, available at two sizes of 23 and 28 millimeters. It is delivered with a steerable transeptal sheath of an outer diameter of 14 French, and the balloon position is achieved um, in the deflated status over the wire in the antrum of the pulmonary veins. After inflation, um, adequate balloon position is checked by injection of contrast dye into the targeted vein, um, which at best shows a complete retention of the contrast dye in the occluded pulmonary vein without any outflow of contrast dye into the left atrium. Then cryoenergy is applied for about five minutes per freeze, achieving temperatures of minus 45 to about minus 70 degrees Celsius measured by a thermocouple which is positioned right proximal at the uh, proximal edge of the balloon. By changing the angle of the steerable sheet or repositioning of the guide wire from a lower to an upper side branch of the pulmonary vein, the balloon antrum contact can be optimized. So what can we say about the acute success of cryoballoon ablation? We were one of the first ones to do an inhuman study with a cryoballoon and um, there were also two other studies um, that studied between 21 and uh, 346 patients. All these groups used um, two sizes of the balloon, the 23 and the 28 millimeter balloon, and um, it took about um, 39 to 58 uh, minutes of fluoroscopy time to do a pulmonary vein isolation with this cryo balloon. The procedure time ranged from 165 minutes to 232 minutes. And uh, the success rate ranged from 84% of the veins, which could be isolated by a balloon only, <coughs> to up uh, of 95% um, of the veins, which could be isolated by a balloon. But still, there is a learning curve, uh, which is also true for the cryo-balloon ablation technique. Um, and um, on the left um, side of the slide, you see the learning curve from our lab at Hanover Medical School. Um, and you see the fluoroscopy time um, has a steep drop um, after six to 10 procedures, but still uh, decreases after 20 procedures, um, which is now at about 20 to 25 minutes after more than 400 procedures with a cryo balloon. Also, the Van Bella group on the right side shows a learning curve, um, and you see that the procedure time and the fluoroscopy time is still dropping after 30 to 40 balloons. So um, it should not be underestimated that also the cryo balloon um, has a learning curve. What helps in uh, doing cryo balloon ablation is to use another transeptal puncture site than we are usually used for um, pulmonary vein isolation. So we perform um, a more anterior and more inferior transeptal puncture to get more space in the left atrium to manipulate the catheter to the right inferior vein and to have more space between the sheath and the right pulmonary vein and to get the balloon more in alignment with the course of the right pulmonary inferior vein. The acute success rate of pulmonary vein isolation is about 85 to 95 percent, uh, which I pointed out earlier. And the permanency of the pulmonary vein isolation has been studied by Ahmed and co-workers, and they found in 12 patients which underwent uh, 23 or 28 millimeter cryo-balloon ablation that 88% of the pulmonary veins remained isolated after 12 weeks, which is about fairly the same than we achieve with radiofrequency ablation. So how does this translate into clinical success? 
here are the first four studies um, which um, aim to show the clinical success of the uh, cryoballoon approach. And um, all these patients were checked um, by ultra ECGs and um, event recorders. The follow-up ranged from six over to nine months to 12 months. And um, in most of the studies, um, both balloon sizes, the 23 and the 28 millimeter balloon size was used. The success rate um, in the end was in all groups after one year at about 70%. What can we say about the safety of cryoballoon ablation? Well, um, in these first um, four um, studies, um, which included about 575 patients, um, there were no crop embolisms, there were no PB stenosis, no high grade or symptomatic PB stenosis. There was no atrioesophageal fistula, and right phrenic nerve palsy was the most frequent complication. However, the good news was that in all of the cases, this right phrenic nerve palsy was um, reversible after 12 months. So why do we have these right, right phrenic nerve palsies? Well, the right phrenic nerve passes anterolateral at the superior vena cava and passes anterior to the right superior pulmonary vein to the diaphragma. And the mean distance between anterior aspects of the right superior pulmonary vein and the right phrenic nerve is about only 2 to 3 millimeters, which is exactly in the range of the mean depth of the cryoablation lesion. So the risk of right phrenic nerve injury increases when a deep balloon uh, position inside the vein is intended, particularly when you use the 23 millimeter balloon. And the perceived higher risk of right phrenic nerve injury in balloon approaches might also be due to the stretch of the nerve over the balloon surface. So my three rules to avoid right phrenic nerve injury during cryoballoon is whenever possible use the 28 millimeter balloon only. You should avoid deep balloon positions in the right superior pulmonary vein and compare the balloon position with your PV angiogram and never accept a balloon compression in the vein. Finally, right phrenic nerve stimulation during ablation um, superior to the balloon position should always be performed during ablation of the septal veins to stop ablation early in case of right phrenic nerve injury. So what can we say about pulmonary vein stenosis and cryoballoon ablation? Well, up to now, a high-grade symptomatic PV stenosis has not been described in the first European studies. However, a careful post-interventional screening has not been performed in most of these smaller studies. Schumacher and co-workers, just as we have recently presented their CT and MRI data of 403 patients three to six months after cryoballoon ablation. They didn't find any severe stenosis defined as a diameter reduction of more than 70% of the vein. However, there were moderate stenosis and mild stenosis, both asymptomatic, in four or two patients, which makes an overall incidence of 1.4% of mild to moderate um, PD stenosis. Notably, only inferior pulmonary veins were affected where a balloon position was rather venous than antral and the balloon showed a compression. So, to my experience, the preservation of the collagen architecture by cryoenergy seemed to prevent the occurrence of severe PV stenosis. However, balloon inflation inside the vein associated with a significant balloon compression, which means pressure on the vessel wall, might hurt the connective tissue of the PV ostium, leading to moderate all but asymptomatic PV stenosis. So, to my mind, it's not the energy and not the ablation per se, but it is the manipulation with the balloon that might lead to PV stenosis. So, cryoballoon ablation of atrial ablation, where are we? The learning curve in using the cryoballoon technique for PV isolation should not be underestimated. Cryoballoon ablation of paroxysmal atrial ablation shows a one-year efficacy rate of 70%, which is comparable to other techniques, especially irrigated rate of frequency ablation, and most likely comparable to any PV isolation technique. The safety profile of the cryoballoon is favorable, particularly if the learning curve has been passed and the 23 millimeter cryoballoon is avoided. 
A 23 mm cry balloon is dispensable since it might be associated with more phrenic nerve injury and more or with asymptomatic moderate PV stenosis. The circular mapping wire, which is expected to come in autumn 2010, um, has the potential to even shorten the already fast procedures and to increase the effectiveness of cryoballoon ablation. So, cryoballoon ablation is really a step forward in AF ablation. However, there is still room for improvement concerning compliant balloons and more bal um, uh, larger balloons in AF ablation. But, um, cryoballoon ablation.